I'm Emily and I was just going to talk to you a bit about how I became an artist and my journey to it and though it's titled Growing an Artist I don't think anyone could physically grow an artist from this presentation but, <laughs> but yeah we shall see um, so I'll make a start but yeah so I just wanted to go back a little bit to the start of my journey because I've had a slightly unconventional route to becoming an artist um, but it very much ties with the theme of nature that is prevalent in my work um, and it's kind of that reconnection with nature so right back at the beginning I was born in the countryside um, and I was fairly feral growing up on a farm running around in mud all day um, and really connecting to earth on a very daily basis um, my parents encouraged me to go and draw when I was bored which in the countryside when you don't have a lot to do that happens quite a lot so art kind of became a place of solace and I was practicing from a very early age drawing ponies and horses and dogs and animals and flowers and just things that were kind of like all surrounding me as I was when I was younger um from that I was really interested in art at school um and yeah doing art scholarships and things like that which was really lovely to be a part of and I always had an ambition to be an artist but I never knew what that was or what that looked like um so when I went to my accountancy father and said that I wanted to study art he was like nah that's not a thing that people do so I was like okay no I don't think it is actually which was quite silly but Though it be a different route into art, I think that it's one that I wouldn't necessarily change now. So I went off to uni and I studied history of art, very much with um, the interest of art still remaining. Um, and through that time at Leeds University, I was supporting um, my studies with commissions of those dogs and horses of the creative um, of the countryside community when I was back at home. Um, so I was still very much a practicing artist. Um, but just didn't really know I was. Um, so then I finished my degree and wanted to move into art and making art accessible for as many people as possible. So I worked in a variety of cultural institutions in marketing, um, which included ArtReach um, in Leicestershire and then the Royal Academy of Arts in London when I moved there and currently at the British Library as well. And as I said, I wanted to make art accessible for everyone. But it got to a point where I was kind of marketing all of these other people's ideas, especially at the Royal Academy and the summer exhibition and that kind of like open forum and the, the route of everyone being able to exhibit there. Um, I kind of just was like, why am I marketing everyone else's ideas and not actually doing my own practice? So literally like a penny that dropped, I was like, right, well, I've got to decide to do this for myself. And I began my own studio practice. Um, and always look to nature as that moment of inspiration and it was wonderful I feel like social media has totally democratized the access to art um, for a self-taught artist as myself and so I was sharing on Instagram and selling work um, since I started my studio practice two days a week back in 2019 and now um, I'm very much an exhibiting artist with Teb's gallery but also I had my solo exhibition last year um, and I've got an ambition to just grow and I feel like I've had a two year studio time free of pressure to just totally explore the theme that I want to land on. And I've landed on nature and it's constant inspiration. So I think that's the way that we're going to go in the future as well. So, yeah, sowing seeds. Um, but just to expand a little bit more about why creativity and nature kind of go hand in hand and where where yeah where that where that sparks kind of come from for me nature is a place of connectivity for me very much to my heritage that I kind of just spoke about um my identity and also my family um all of those things are absolutely just I think probably the most important things to all of us um and yeah so nature for me is very wrapped up in all of those things and exactly who I am so it seems it seems the logical thing that my art would encompass that. Um, I also found it to be a visual metaphor. Um, so when I was making that move from working behind a laptop five days a week to then setting up my own studio practice, before 
doing the studio practice. I don't know whether it's a mixture. I have uh, very like quite bad dyslexia. And um, I just felt like I had this creativity literally stuck in my head that felt like all of this energy and colour that was not able to kind of have a vent or any place in society, essentially, um, as I was living that corporate life. And so the flower head that you can see on the left, that was like my first move into really trying to visualise that and get it down into an artwork. Um, so, yeah, I always felt like nature was a visual metaphor for the creativity that lies within my own head, but also, I believe, within everyone. Um, but actually, society is not necessarily built towards appreciating it or listening to it very much. Um, and then finally, well, not finally, but um nature as I mentioned is a solace um growing up on a farm and I think that it's got that leaning back to um my childhood but also as we went through that pandemic um that pandemic that happened or that is happening still <laughs> but as we were going through the pandemic I think that it was the the thing that many of us kind of leaned closer to and I remember there was like a series of bow covers that Edward Einerful um put and it was kind of like a series of artists including including Rabina Hamid um putting nature at the forefront and he gave nature that spot on five bow covers and so I feel like that just so many people were finding solace in nature um during the pandemic and then it's just a place of continuous inspiration with four seasons a year um, and just nature, both in our own gardens, across the uh, country, around the world, it being so different in every single kind of, um, every single landscape, there is continuous inspiration that I could possibly try and find. So I feel like I'm only just scratching the surface at the moment. So that is why I'm going, going down the nature route. Um, but the way that I did this through my work over the last few years, so the first stage was kind of back in 2019 when I was giving myself that studio space. And it was basically explorations through colour, through joy and through beauty. And I think that that's the thing that I've always been drawn to in art anyway, um, very much inspired by like the Matisse, David Hockney, and just trying to find the fun in it and the joy in it. I feel like that the... the the world needs a little bit of fun so that's the way that I've kind of got the route that I kind of used as an entry point to exploring art on the left you can see just some uh, fun illustrations that I did and on the right hand side these are more studies that um, the top left one is one of Kew Gardens um, and then the other three are from a local park I found during lockdown called Camazaro Park and um, so yeah they're just kind of the studies that I was using to explore and then next with the pandemic kind of became a development that I've touched on already and I think that I was looking to nature already but as everyone collectively looked toward nature um, then I wanted to develop those the questions and our wider relationship um, beyond just beauty. So on the left hand side are two artists so at the top there is Eugenio Ampudia and he um, did an incredible inspiration during lockdown whilst the opera house in Barcelona, the Grand Teatro del Lisieux, and I feel like that is really poor pronunciation, but he basically filled the theatre with plants um, and they were the replacement for people, but very much a living, breathing organism. So I was really intrigued as to how, yeah, how just why we think we're different to plants essentially and why we disassociate ourselves from nature. And then similarly below, this is Celine Bowman. Um, and this piece is called Parliament of Plants. And she was questioning that same thing of why do we feel like we're disassociating intelligence from plants as well? Like why do we think we're better being human um, and having a thinking brain when actually there is the creativity, there's intelligence in nature as well. Um, so how that kind of developed in my own work on the right hand side is just the looking back to the flower head motif um, and trying to find different metaphors um, that were arising in my own life beyond just beauty and yeah bringing in kind of I was doing lots of um, life drawing online with my friends uh, during lockdown and 
as you can imagine, the conversation kind of turned from one of like, oh, this is so quaint and fun to this is really boring. And it was just kind of exploring again that kind of creativity that wasn't being able to be used but I think in a different kind of sense because it wasn't being able to be used in a social sense so it was just all of these flowerhead people kind of sat with sat like lemons essentially um with bitter lemons in lockdown um and then below this one's my partner and me in bed but it's again it's kind of just finding a different metaphor of um how when you find kind of like love and um, a, a relationship that really nurtures you and trying to use that kind of creative, um, uh, yeah, just repurposing that metaphor, visual metaphor for something that's nurturing as well. So yeah, that was me just trying to explore and develop that um, interrogation slightly. Um, and then I was putting together a body of work um, this year as we were kind of coming out of lockdown um, and really we wanted to pull together all of these different strands and ideas and things that I had going on um, and it was really all landing on kind of our critical relationship with nature so just some of the questions that the work that I was producing were trying to answer was is nature seen as a mere commodity do you connect with nature because it kind of became apparent that though I feel like I have this connectivity quite a lot of people don't um, can we replicate the beauty found in nature? Do we disassociate creativity and intelligence from nature? Do we underestimate the power of nature? And I think the answer to the final one is definitely yes, but yeah, I, those are just, I wanted the question to, to be the entry point for different audiences and people to explore themselves rather than just giving people my thoughts and answer. I want people to be able to enter into that conversation. So these are just a couple of the works that were inspired by those questions. On the left hand side, it's the big pink one. Um, and basically, the big pink one was, um, it was as much of a pleasing and tropical aesthetic that kind of mimics the images of nature that are served to us through Instagram. I realized that I was just, I, I be living in a city, if you don't get outside, I connect to nature through Instagram. And is that real? I don't think so. And it seems as though quite a lot of people are living under that illusion of like, you're wanting to connect to nature, but you're connecting through kind of clickbait likes and shares as opposed to real connectivity. So it's all a bit of an illusion. And then on the right hand side is Belittle, which is for sale with Herb's Gallery. Um, but Belittle, the, the flowers here, I found in the Barbican Conservatory in London. And they're called angel's trumpets or brugmansia. And essentially they're called angel's trumpets because they have a floral scent that entices people and animals to them and it entices them to eat them, but they are poisonous. And so it's kind of, do we underestimate the power of nature? And nature has all of these different uh, coping mechanisms to protect itself that at first look beautiful to us and quite quaint, but actually are really deadly. So we shouldn't underestimate the power of nature. Um, and then on the left hand side are two works called New Season and Dark Waters and similarly to the big pink one, it was kind of looking at um, the way that we're consuming nature through Instagram um, and just basically always wanting to just, um, well, I th think it was on World Environment Day, I was really hit by all of these images of nature. Um, but that were matched up to wanting to buy something. And so it was basically me com combining the beauty of nature, but at the top you can kind of see new season and dear, dear, I had so many emails saying, dear Emily, your new season looks are here, buy this, buy that, kind of Black Friday or associated with World Environment Day. And it's just to try and think of nature beyond a mere commodity. And then on the right hand side, we've kind of touched on this already, but disassociating creativity and intelligence from nature and just kind of plopping a beautiful, um, I don't know, I really want to go here where I've painted. It looks like such a beautiful jungle scene that, but yeah, and do we kind of disassociate nature and intelligence from, from each other? Cool. 
But yeah, and then these three are three that are also for sale, Mother, Altus and Advance. And they just ask the question of whether we can replicate the beauty found in nature. Um, I've done my best job, but I don't think that we can. Um, and so these are almost kind of look at, looking at beautiful images and um, photos and also uh, drawings that I did from studies in Kew Gardens. Um, when I was finding that solace in the city and just trying to put an artist's impression upon whether we believe that we can capture its beauty. And I hope that I've done a fairly good job, but I don't think that it quite, I don't know, fully captures it. But um, in the middle is Altus, on the right is Advance, and on the left is Mother. So yeah, and then the future. So just what I'm going to be doing next. Um, this image here is also for sale and it's called Plentiful. Um, the image was um, inspired by a image from the collection. So I live in, I grew up in a place called Cottesbrook and it's an estate village. And in the middle of the estate is Cottesbrook Hall and they have an amazing artistic collection. Um, this was inspired by one of the images and I was really struck by the fact that exotic birds, exotic um, fruits um, and things from afar. We used to show wealth um, back in the day and through art history. Um, and actually when I was painting or drawing them, it really struck me that these are all things that we just consider day to day. So hence the Tesco receipt down in the left hand side. Um, and I just wanted to try and question our consumption and the way that we use nature as a complete commodity and don't really think about it at all. But this is um, a narrative that I want to go down in the future. And so having painted this one, I then this painting, I then found that there was an amazing term called pronkstilleven, um, which is from the Dutch painters in the 17th and 18th centuries. And essentially when the Dutch were colonialized, um, were colonizing um, various places around the world. They would bring back all of these riches and put together extravagant still lives for artists to paint. So this is something that I'd like to um, now explore in a series of paintings. Um, so questioning our consumption, but also maybe hosting community workshops in order to get uh, people's thoughts on what objects they overconsume in their lives to include in the paintings. And also just start that community conversation because like anything as big as climate change, it needs so many different people part of that conversation. I want to enable others to join that journey and have our act as that access point. But also seasonality. I want to lean closer to nature um, to see how it can reflect more in my work. So maybe having a set of four of these paintings that one represents spring, summer, autumn, winter, and trying to bring bring nature closer, essentially. And then finally, um, as part of my work, so the series of paintings that I've just talked about were part of a solo exhibition that I hosted over the summer, and. I've always wanted to have, well, I have a very supportive, nurturing community behind me. And very similarly to what I was just saying, I want to bring them into the conversation around nature and around us all kind of embracing our inner creativity as well. Um, and so for the opening exhibition, I asked everyone to bring their own flowers um, and they brought their own flowers and then we I made a living sculpture from them, which is this picture on the left, um, which is called Bring Your Own Flowers. And just last week, I found an artist called Anna Mendieta, um, who was a Cuban artist who grew up in America. Um, and she's kind of just completely um, and succinctly pulled together what I think the next stage of my artist journey is. And it's my art is grounded in the belief of one universal energy which runs through everything from insect to man, from man to specter, from specter to plant, from plant to galaxy. Through my earth body sculptures, I become one with the earth and I become an extension of nature and nature becomes an extension of my body. And so, so alongside these paintings that I just spoke about, I really want to explore the living sculpture element as well to further my like connection to heritage, our shared humanity and our relationship to the planet and bring more people along the journey so that yeah and that's kind of my intention but yeah um 
Oh, I'm really bad because it's always like the most recent thing that I've done because I see it. I see all my work as kind of like this continuous journey. So it see it tends to always be my previous artwork. But if I skip back, my favorite by far was this one in the middle because this was my first painting that I really felt embodied what I wanted to say um, and kind of set me on the journey for all of those critical questions. Mm. But from there, it's definitely plentiful because then it's kind of set me on to this um, next journey of exploring consumption and wanting to get community on, involved in that. Um, and then another one is this one, um, Bring Your Own Flowers. And that's purely because it's the first piece where I have been able to bring together that aspect of community in an actual living sculpture. And it was really fun to wade in Wimbledon Common as well. So yeah, I had to find a photographer who was uh, mad enough to get up at 5 a.m. Um, to meet me at Wimbledon Common in summer but he was and he was great he's called Jonathan Dwyer so I feel like I should give him a shout out I think I would just say to start and to um oh I'm such a deep thinker but basically I would probably ask them to ignore try and think about in their head which voice is fearful and which isn't because when I first started I was like oh I don't know I don't know whether I can or whether I should or and it was only when I was like none of those fearful thoughts are helpful like, and, and I'm just really enjoying what I'm doing now because I've been able to be like that fearful thought is not helpful at all and yeah so I think I would just if you were going to start painting when you're entering into it just learn which thought to ignore and which one to just be like but I want to enjoy it and I want to have fun there's an artist called Camilla Mengstrom on um, Instagram and she is also self-taught and she dances every day and she posts it on Instagram as well but I think she really captures kind of the level of fun that art can hold for you so I think that yeah you just need to forget about the fear and just go and enjoy it